Hi there, this is uh, Neha Pagadipati. I'm a preventive cardiologist at Duke and the Duke Clinical Research Institute. And I'm also an associate editor for Jack. And I am thrilled today to be joined by Dr. Subodh Verma, who's of course a world renowned investigator and trialist, um, and who is the first author of the recently published um, secondary analysis from the SELECT trial on um, sex-based outcomes. And so Dr. Subodh Verma, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you, Neha. It's uh, it's really my my great pleasure. Um, I, I'm Subodh Verma. Uh, I'm a cardiac surgeon and scientist, uh, and professor at the University of Toronto, and uh, I'm really uh, delighted and honored to be part of your uh, discussion today. Well, thank you. So maybe just to kind of level set and make sure that everybody's on the same page, this is a secondary analysis that you and and your co-authors performed from the SELECT trial. Maybe you could just remind us exactly what the SELECT trial looked at and what it showed overall. Uh, for sure. So the SELECT trial was a, a large global trial of 17,604 individuals. It asked a specific question, and that is, in people who are living with overweight and obesity with a BMI of over 27, who are aged 45 and above, uh, who don't have coincident diabetes, can a GLP-1 receptor agonist, in this case semaglutide, when used at the obesity dose of 2.4 milligrams once weekly, reduce major adverse cardiovascular events. So it was really a sort of a secondary prevention study, if I may, uh, in people optimally treated with statins, optimally treated with background medical therapy, uh, asking the question, you know, is GLP-1 RA an anti-atherosclerotic medication? Is it a medication that can reduce MACE events even in people uh, who don't have diabetes, uh, but are living with overweight and obesity. And it's sort of the sister trial of, you know, the diabetes trials, right? You know, the, these drugs were shown to reduce major adverse cardiovascular events, albeit at a lower dose in Sustain 6 and Pioneer 6 uh, in people living with diabetes. But there was a lot of uh, sort of uh, data, uh, indirect data, some translational data, uh, some sub-analyses that suggested that the efficacy of GLP-1 RAs may be agnostic to uh, background uh, presence or absence of diabetes or level of glycemia or uh, changes in A1C and, and that they may be uh, sort of uh, therapies that potentially may have direct vascular protective benefits. So uh, that led to this sort of thesis that if that's the case, then will it actually be a strategy in people with overweight and obesity to reduce MACE events? And the primary outcome uh, was reduced by 20% over about a three-year follow-up. I mean, it was absolutely, you know, it was, it really was a landmark study. And, and, and the question of whether or not semaglutide um, um, kind of differentially impacts people based on their sex is a really important one, right? Because we know that um, for individuals with diabetes, for example, that wasn't the select trial population, but for individuals with diabetes, women who have diabetes have a significantly increased risk compared to, you know, men with diabetes. And what was less clear is in individuals with overweight or obesity, if that kind of differential in risk by sex also exists. And so this was a very, you know, important and relevant question to ask within the, within the select trial population. Could you tell us a little bit about kind of overall what you found? Yeah, for sure. So I, I agree with you 100% uh, that when it comes to uh, ischemic heart disease or it comes to heart failure and, and uh, you know, looking at sex-based differences are really important. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we've recently published the sex-based analyses from a heart failure trial in Jack, and that's, uh, you know, in a heart failure with preserved ejection fraction population where we know more females actually develop uh, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But in the context of ischemic heart disease, there has been uh, you know, a, a, a lot of discussion over the last several years, and, and, and that pertains to how obesity and coincident insulin resistance and diabetes may modulate risk to a higher extent in uh, females versus males. And uh, it has been suggested that when uh, females actually with overweight and obesity have insulin resistant states, that triggers, you know, an aberrant upregulation of uh, MRA, uh, mineral corticoid receptors and aldosterone. It may also cause, you know, changes in estrogen signaling. It may lead to an increase in androgen. So 
you know, non-traditional kind of risk factors may emerge in the context of overweight and obesity, particularly in insulin resistant females. And so the question has been, uh, you know, uh, what would happen in a population of people with ASCBD uh, who don't have coincident uh, diabetes per se? And that's a very unique population in select. So all of our understanding of how uh, sex modulates vascular risk has been derived from trials that have not excluded people with diabetes. So we have never been able to understand the relationship between overweight and obesity, of course, defined as BMI, and I'm sure we'll get to the limitations of that in a few seconds, but how does that relate to risk of uh, MACE events when you don't have a major confounder and that is you know, type two diabetes? Uh, so that was one of the important reasons to ask this question. And second, you know, uh, we know that they are, in addition to uh, sort of traditional risk factors, non-traditional risk factors in females that are important in, in the context of ischemic heart disease. You know, uh, excess weight gain during pregnancy is one, you know, uh, gestational diabetes, uh, you know, the fact uh, preeclampsia in some individuals, uh, menopause and age of menopause and estrogen protection, uh, premenopausally, et cetera. So all of those kinds of factors are important. And as you correctly mentioned during the review, you know, when we were discussing this paper with, with you, you know, the importance of highlighting a sort of sexual, uh, sex-based uh, dimorphism with respect to fat distribution, right, is also quite unique, you know, uh, where fat is located and distributed in males versus females tends to be different. And its prognostic impact also is different based on where fat is actually deposited. So for all of those reasons, understanding just baseline characteristics and risk in this population was imperative. And what we found was that, first of all, from a baseline characteristic standpoint, the age was almost the same in this population. But, uh, you know, there were certain risk factors that were different between males and females. About a third of uh, females uh, uh, were enrolled in the in this global trial of 17,000 patients. And, uh, you know, the age was almost the same, but BMI was higher. Um, and LDL cholesterol was higher. Use of statins was lower. Use of beta blockers was lower. Uh, uh, you know, uh, there was also higher C-reactive protein levels uh, compared to males. So those were some of the sort of differences that we found. On the flip side, from a protective standpoint, rates of smoking tend to be lower and HDL cholesterol was higher. Uh, so, uh, you know, um, you know, when we look at that in, in totality, uh, despite the fact that there were, you know, higher LDL, higher BMI, higher CRP, and the same age, uh, the uh, MACE events, uh, event rates in the placebo group were about 40% higher in males compared to females. So then we wondered, you know, is this just because of differences in the type of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease that females were enrolled with versus males? And it turns out that that was also a very important difference, uh, a differentiating feature. Uh, about, you know, 50% uh, or so of uh, men uh, had a, uh, sorry, I think about 70% of males actually had a history of myocardial infarction versus 50% of females had a history of myocardial infarction. So the first thought for us when we looked at this was maybe the differences in risk, the lower risk in females, despite sort of maybe a higher burden of conventional risk factors, may be driven through the fact that they've got less history of myocardial infarction. So we then looked at the subgroup of females and males that just had a prior history of MI, and even in that group, we found that there was the so-called protection in, in, in this group. And then, you know, again, thanks to the wonderful review that we had with Jack and the conversation that we had, Neha, the question was, is there any way to tease out sort of menopausal status or perimenopausal status, given the fact that we enrolled people 45 years of age and older? So, of course, we must have enrolled a population of people premenopausal that may actually be sort of uh, skewing the risk level towards a lower level of risk. Now, we did not capture that 
formally in the trial. So what we did is we just looked at the subgroup of individuals over the age of 65 males and females to sort of as a surrogate of, you know, uh, a postmenopausal female versus a male. And even in that context, we found lower risk of sort of cardiovascular events there. So I, I think this is new information for a unique population of uh, women living with females living with overweight and obesity who don't have diabetes. I mean that's an that's an excellent summary, and I agree it, it provides a lot of information about these about these groups um, within a relatively kind of newly studied population. Can you talk a little bit about the um, the effect of semaglutide by sex in terms of um, weight changes and in terms of CRP reduction? Because um, yes. you know there are a lot of questions around how GLP one receptor agonists work, and obviously a lot of people are wondering about weight loss and about and, and about inflammation reduction. Right, so it's a really important question. And so what we found in SELECT was that females lost uh, you know, more weight than males in the context of uh, the semaglutide 2.4. Uh, there was also a greater reduction in waist circumference that we noted, and there was also a greater reduction in CRP as a sort of surrogate marker of inflammation. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, despite the fact that we had greater weight loss and greater CRP reductions and greater reductions in waist circumference, uh, we saw sort of very consistent benefits with respect to cardiovascular event reduction. Uh, the MACE event rates were reduced sort of almost in an identical fashion in males and females. All of the uh, sort of expanded outcomes as we've reported in the JAK paper uh, were all consistently reduced. Uh, the individual outcomes were in uh, of, of MACE and the expanded MACE outcome, including CV death, all cause mortality, et cetera, where there was no real heterogeneity in males versus females. And then we tried to, you know, evaluate whether there was any uh, sex-based differences after uh, adjusting or uh, for, you know, BMI or, you know, uh, CRP levels or GFR levels or prior history of myocardial infarction. Um, and uh, we've reported that as well in the in the JAK paper, and we found really no heterogeneity uh, per se in that regard. So it goes back to the question you were just sort of uh, asking, and that is that there are, first of all, females have not just the same efficacy on weight, but greater efficacy on weight and greater reduction in CRP. And, you know, it is possible that the weight reduction and the CRP are correlated and related. And we, mm -hmm. you know, in a prior uh, analysis uh, in STEP, uh, not the step hef pef but the STEP trials of overweight and obesity, we did see that greater weight reduction was associated with greater reductions in CRP. So those two things may be related. But what it also tells us is that if uh, inflammation reduction, let's say, was the dominant mechanism through which this therapy was uh, providing vascular benefit, then you would expect that greater reductions in CRP would be associated with greater reductions in outcome. Uh, and likewise, if we thought that weight reduction was the dominant mechanism through which these benefits were being observed, then you would actually expect to have a greater absolute risk reduction here. So the fact that the relative risk reduction is sort of agnostic to these factors, it doesn't take away from the benefits of weight reduction or inflammation reduction per se, but it does raise the question as to you know, are these mechanisms sort of seen independent or in addition to the benefits of weight? And there's actually quite a lot written about that in the basic science literature and the translational science literature that, you know, there may be anti-inflammatory effects at the level of vasculature that may not, may or may not be reflective in CRP. There may be changes in sort of regenerative cell uh, flux. That's some of the work that we've done and published on that the vascular regenerative stem cell pool may actually be, uh, you know, uh, there may be a, a reduction in regenerative cell exhaustion that occurs uh, in, in, in people taking a GLP-1 agonist. Uh, so there may be other effects that we just haven't been able to measure that may be at the root of this benefit. And, you know, I think when I think about, you know, what do I, what do I as a clinician, a practicing cardiologist like you as a cardiac surgeon, like, what do I take away from this for my patients? Um, and I think there's several things, but one of the biggest messages I have taken away from this is, yet again, there it, there is consistency of benefit by sex. There is no reason to not treat 
um, females compared with males. And we see that even in your study, right? We saw that uh, females were less likely to be treated with statins, less likely to be treated with beta blockers. And we see this kind of time and time again that there's under treatment um, in females compared with males. And I think this underscores the importance of um, you know, uh, the benefit um, being kind of equitably distributed um, across populations who would benefit. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, um, every time um, I have the opportunity of writing a uh, paper uh, based on sort of uh, sex based differences, the first message I think is as trialists, we have to continue to strive to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, be fair and equitable in terms of representation not just by sex, but also across different sort of ethnic groups and racial groups. And, you know, I, I think, you know, we had about 27% females in this trial, but I think that number can and should be higher in the future as we strive towards getting data that is representative of the populations that we treat. I think the second message is, you know, uh, uh, the for the practicing clinician in the trenches like you and I, you know, use semaglutide 2.4 in the appropriate patient, uh, you know, with confidence that the benefits are really seen in in uh, in, in by uh, in both sexes uh, very consistently, and knowing that weight reduction will be greater in the context of uh, females uh, with overweight or obesity, but without diabetes. As you know, people living with diabetes tend to lose less weight compared to mm -hmm. people without diabetes, yet they derive the same cardiovascular benefit, yet another reason to suspect that these benefits may be weight independent. And the third issue is, I think it came up during the review with, with, uh, with you and your colleagues was, you know, just reminding people about tolerability. And and we have mentioned that in the Jack paper that the tolerability in females was excellent. In fact, if anything, fewer females compared to males discontinued semaglutide. The GI side effects were similar, but overall discontinuation due to AEs or SAEs were actually numerically fewer in females uh, compared to males. So, uh, and I, I think you you hit the nail on the on, on the head here when you said, you know, no matter how we look at these trials, somehow background therapy is lower than males, right? And and you know, uh, lower use of uh, of some of statins and lower higher LDL cholesterol at baseline, irrespective of what kind of ASCVD phenotype you have, the LDL thresholds have to be the same, right? So, you know, uh, that just speaks to the need for us to you know continue to strive to close that gap that still exists. Well, Sabo, thank you so much for taking the time to join us uh, today to talk about your paper, and um, we're we're very grateful uh, for this opportunity. Well, thank you, and and let me just say, it was a absolutely phenomenal experience for me working with you and working with Dr. Crumholz as the editor in chief and all of your staff. You made it such a seamless, uh, you know, uh, submission you know, talking to us on the weekends and on the evenings and through email and just facilitating the sort of, uh, you know, I felt like we had concierge kind of red carpet <laughs> service and I've never seen that at any journal. And, uh, you know, you're grateful. In fact, we are double grateful for the honor of actually being able to, uh, you know, publish our work in your journal. Thank you so much for your kind words.